You are listening to the Faith City Outreach with your host, Marina Maria, who is also the founder of Global Gospel Worship Radio. Marina interviews local pastors and global leaders to share their testimonies and their ministries. Marina wants you to remember Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Now here's your host, Marina Maria. I declare the scripture, Zechariah 2, 5, over Faith City Outreach, where the Lord says, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Welcome to Faith City Outreach. This is Marina Maria with today's special returning guest, Pastor Robert Clancy from Narrow Path Ministries International in Perth, Western Australia. Thank you very much for returning today, uh, Pastor Robert. I am really looking forward to continuing our discussion about spiritual warfare because it's such an important topic that every Christian should be knowledgeable and proactive about. Yes, thank you so much, and it's great to be back with you again today. The question is, do you think America and the world is experiencing more spiritual warfare than ever before? Absolutely. And let me look at it from a biblical point of view. Uh, When we go to the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 2, it says, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat, no wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, I want to talk about that because we can see that Daniel was an end-time prophet. That means the revelation he was receiving was for the end times that we are currently living in now. But there was an opposition from him receiving the revelation that we need to understand today more so because we are living in those days. Now, what was he coming up against? He was coming up against a principality. So let's look at that. A principality is defined as a state ruled by a prince usually a relatively small state or state that falls within a large state, such as an empire. So the position or authority of a prince or chief ruler, sovereignty or supreme power. So a principality is actually not a fallen angel itself, but a principality is actually the seat of authority or the region that the fallen angel has authority over. So a prince rules over a principality. And we see that here in Daniel chapter 10. So every single nation has a principality that works over areas. And that spiritual warfare for the church is coming up against that. An actual fact is that every city I go to, there is a spiritual force or like a spiritual layer or a spiritual blanket over that city. And that is trying to hinder the prayers of the saints. So let me just break that down to three different people. The Lord has shown me that if a saint prays and their prayer goes up, it is hindered by this spiritual force. Now, if let's say, for instance, the Bible says, according to John 9, verse 31, it says, God does not hear the prayers of sinners but only those that worship and are obedient to him. Now, what happens is if a saint tries to pray, but they are in sin, then God can't hear that, right? So they must confess their sin. They must repent before. That's what we see in, um, you know, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people call by my name, humble themselves, repent of their sins, then I will hear their sins and heal their land. So, So their prayer goes up like smoke, but it is taken by the wind and is not able to penetrate this force. Then there is a second group of Christians. Now, according to the Bible, it says in James chapter two, sorry, James chapter three, it says that uh, you know when we when we pray amiss, our, our prayers are not answered. They ask, but they do not pray. They don't have understanding of what they're praying for, and that's what we do when we don't pray with Scripture. When we don't understand prayers of Scripture, it's like this smoke goes up into the air, but it's not powerful enough to penetrate 
through that spiritual bat, uh, barrier, which is caused by the principality, which is the prince that sits in that seat that hinders our prayers. But then there is a third type of Christian, which is the Bible says we must pray in the spirit. We must pray with understanding. And when they pray, according to the Bible, it says, according to James 5, verse 16, it says the fervent prayers of a righteous man shall availeth much. When their prayer goes up, it goes up like fire. And when it comes up against this spiritual barrier, it penetrates that spiritual barrier. It, it bursts through and it creates an open heaven of prayer. Now, that is where healings take place. Deliverance takes place. Prophecy, you know, the spiritual giftings activate in this particular place. Now, that is the type of prayer that we need in warfare. Because we see in Daniel chapter 10, it says in verse 10, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knee and on, on the palm of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the day that you first set your heart to understand, which means pray, to humble yourself before God, your words were heard and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vision refers to many days yet to happen. What happened here? Is he praying? But from the first day, God heard the prayer. He sent a messenger to give the message of the revelation that we are privileged to have today. But what happened is the principality, that prince of Persia withstood him, meaning there was a spiritual battle in the second heavens. And then Michael, the archangel, came to fight the battle so that he could break through. So sometimes as Christians, we may think that our prayers are not being answered. Like Daniel, for 21 days, he thought, oh, you know, my prayers are not being answered. Maybe you think your prayers are not being answered because there is a spiritual force that is trying to hinder us from having the breakthrough that we need. And ultimately, that principality or that prince in that seat of principality doesn't want revival to come to the church of Jesus Christ. So let's look at this. Our principalities are over cities, regions, and nations, and are hindering revival. So these fallen angels promote dullness, darkness, spiritual lethargy. The reason the church is not experiencing an open heaven is because of these fallen angels. Principalities will not face their final judgment until after Jesus returns to the earth. However, they can be temporarily judged at times in this age by the prayers of the saints. A fallen angel over a regional country may be bound for a time if the courts of heaven have so determined. So let's look at this. There was a great revival in Argentina that occurred because the principality was bound over that nation. People were suddenly open to the gospel. Pastors and evangelists were moving in remarkable miracles. People were rushing to meetings, crusades, and churches to be healed and to be saved. The nation went from being hardened to God to being open to the gospel. It was like a switch that had been turned on. Once the fallen angel was bound, the heavens opened over Argentina and light shining over that nation because the binding of the principality was the key to their revival. So we see over America right now, everything that's happening in your nation is also affecting the other nations. Everything that's happening in Australia is also affecting this nation, what happens. So the prayers of the saints are so vital in binding up that spiritual force. How do we do that? We do that in corporate prayer, in corporate worship. It comes from Second Chronicles you know, 714, my people who are called by my name, 
The truth is we don't see enough repentance. We don't see enough people on their knees at the altar of God crying out for mercy that God would help them because the devil has tend to bound up people. So we're living in a world and our community and our church needs revival like never before. So, so within our nations, everything that's happening in your politics, everything that's happening in our politics, everything that's happening in the nations, we as a church need to pray because the Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation. That is the prayers of the righteous saints. Remember, the fervent prayers of a righteous man shall availeth much. Now, if Elijah was just a mere man, but he prayed and the heavens opened and the heavens closed, then God has also given that authority to the church to understand that through prayer and understanding of the scriptures, we can also see God pour out his spirit again. Now, you gave an example of the people in Argentina. They yes. got together. They united. What's Absolutely. not happening in these other places? We're not uniting. Is that what you're saying? That we're divided? Yes, we're, we're divided. We're just working on our own? Or we're, just... we're working on our own. And, and what the biggest thing is, see, there are majors and minors in doctrinal belief. Sometimes we get caught in the minors, but we should just focus on the majors, meaning you know, doctrinal belief. There are some things that you, 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 you can't mix with certain people because their doctrine is so wrong. But what I'm saying is that we've got to look beyond certain things and say to ourselves, okay, let's pray because the nation is being affected. There is a spiritual force. But remember, revival is not necessarily going to be until everyone's united because revival itself will bring the revival, will bring the unity. But what has to happen, it just needs to start with two or three people. And I mean two or three serious people. Because when I, when I study the history of revival around the nations, it wasn't like, you know, 100,000 people had to come together united forcefully. Because you can't force it. But right. it can start from two old ladies that are praying for revival to come to the nation. But they've understood what it means to pray. Pray with understanding. Pray with scripture pray with the help of the Holy Spirit, and that itself will stir up revival. That is promising to hear, because when I asked you that question, you actually answered it in a different way that I thought that you were going to answer, because I thought you needed a group of people, but you said it just takes two serious people. Yes, that's right, just two. So we what? need this revival. Excuse me? I said, we need this revival for the church today. What do you think needs to happen to see the revival? What you just said? Well, okay. Is so, there anything else that needs to happen more for a yeah. revival to happen? A world revival? Absolutely. And that is what, that is the hope of the church. The hope of the church is ultimately to enter the kingdom of God and to partake of the wedding feast of the Lamb. But as we are waiting, as we are tarrying and waiting, our prayers or hope should be that God would revive. But see, revival starts with us as individuals. It doesn't need to take, you know, 100,000 people. All it needs to take is an individual to be revived by the Holy Spirit because when you are ignited, then you will also go and ignite others. So revival, when it comes as a whole, it will change the spiritual atmosphere to ignite a spiritual confrontation between light and darkness. And this is coming back to the spiritual warfare aspect. So anything dark in you, on you, or around you will start to manifest, to be delivered and exposed. So when the blood brought saints start praying for revival to come, it will cause hemorrhaging within the realms of darkness. So before a general revival is birthed, there can be also an Ishmael, meaning a counterfeit. So we've got to be, uh, we've got to be aware of that. We need a revival of the word of God and we need a revival of the spirit because the word of God keeps the church on. It's like a train on the train tracks, right? It keeps it steady. It keeps it, keeps it on the path, the narrow path. But, but if you don't have the spirit, which is the steam for the train to go, it's not going to move. But if you have, a revival or a counterfeit revival that can come without the word, 
is that the train will come off the railway tracks and it will be brought into deception. And that's what we don't want. So we need to pray for the word of God. We need to pray for the, the revival of the spirit uh, to come today. Because today we have too many churches that are no more than a meeting hall. There isn't enough power of God in most of them today because we are set on our church programs. You know, we've canceled prayer meetings. We've canceled Bible study. And now we're, we're watching, you know, um, the Super Bowl or something like that. That's, that's what they do or hear the, that they put on these big things on the big screen in church. Now, that is not going to cause revival. So we need to do things that would cause it. You know, we have more churches. Now, look at this. We have more churches than we have ever had before in the world. We have more preachers. We have more Bible studies. We have more Christian television. We have more Christian radio, more Christian websites, more Christian social media accounts. We have more people running around promoting religion itself, but we are actually impacting the world less than before. So that shows us that we need God's help. We've tried to do it our way. We've tried to do it in our own man-made ways, but now we need God's spirit, God's ways to do it. You know, the Bible says, you know, according to 2 Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We need to have the freedom of the Holy Spirit to guide and lead the church to where we need to go. Now, we also need God to raise up consecrated vessels according to second peter 1 21 it says for prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit we need those consecrated vessels that have gone through the fire we need those type of preachers that are not ashamed to preach the truth that are not ashamed to preach against sin to make you feel uncomfortable in your chair that the Holy Spirit may bring conviction to change you. You know, there is too much tickling of ears messages, too many self-motivated messages. A self-motivated message will not cause revival. But Paul, imagine this, was on a mission and he went, you know, to a place. And in that place, he started to preach as directed. He was preaching salvation, repentance and receiving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, wherever he would go and minister. And then all of a sudden, there's an account that took place in Acts chapter 19. And we see that we see that there was some, you know, some of these priests that came along, they tried to cast out some demons, uh, you know, saying in the name of Jesus, come out. But then all of a sudden, the demons started to attack the people. And the demon actually said, hey, you know, Paul, we know, uh, Jesus, we know, but who are you? And that's the problem today. In spiritual warfare, when you pray and fast, all hell will know who you are. But if, but if the <laughs> devil doesn't know who you are, then that's the problem. And that's what we had here. We've got people that can give good messages. They can look the part. But the truth is, are we a threat to the enemy? Because as a result of this, as a result of this incident, even though it was a bad thing because these guys got beaten up by this demon possessed person. It says there that the people of that area, this became both known to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burn them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of God grew mightily and it prevailed. Let me tell you that even in that incident, because they recognized that Paul who came as a consecrated vessel, didn't come with his own understanding, but came with the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the blood of Jesus Christ, they saw that it had the power. Imagine if, you know, just I'll use your, uh, uh, you know, your homeland as an example. Imagine if we went to Mexico and we went with a message of the gospel that all of a sudden everyone that practices Santeria came running out of their homes, putting all those accursed things 
and started to burn them. And it created a revival throughout Mexico or yes. in Africa, in fetishes or in Australia, you know, <laughs> the witches or in America, the witches there. Now that is what we need. We need the gospel to be preached in its pure form. And at the same time, also in such a love of God for the lost souls, it will create yes. a revival. And I believe it is time. We don't need, you know, just a gospel that says love, 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 you know, because, you know, the angels in heaven sing holy, holy, holy. They don't sing love, love, love. So we've got to understand that we are created in God's image, but we are not automatically given the characteristic of holiness. It is something we ourselves need to allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to purify us. How does that happen? By spending time with God. These people that are cried out, you know, in Argentina for revival, they didn't have a casual Christianity mentality. They had a deep seeking, you know, desire in their hearts to mm -hmm. seek God until they found him. So there needs to be, you know, such, you know, today, you know, you know, in, in most houses, we find that TV has become an idol in the house. Mm -hmm. We tend to put TV on before we even pray. So yes. even family prayer is starting to decrease in homes. But we need to come back to our personal prayer, come back to our family prayer, come back to prayer in churches, come back to prayer in the community, in the workplace, in the schools. We need to just enable God to move within our societies, to bring that hunger, because there are people that are suffering out there and they, we have the answer. But at the moment, if we're saying that we have more churches, more Bible colleges, that's more not the answer. That, that is not the answer. The exactly. answer is God, we've tried to do it on our own. We need your help. And it's a matter of us saying, God, we can't do it anymore. You know, yes. it, you know Pastor so Robert, it, we've been operating in the flesh. Yes. We've been grieving so. the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And the time is now. We need to stop that. Yes. We need world repentance. Amen. And as you said, we need to be specific in prayers and use scriptures and be knowledgeable of the word of yeah. God and to learn to pray in the spirit. Now, I have heard also, too, in churches, yeah. you had mentioned praying in the spirit. People yes. fear that. Yes. How does a pastor go about removing that fear? From through people teaching. well it comes down to teaching the problem is today like I, as i go to some nations and i'm talking about spirit-filled churches yes. they will say all of a sudden we don't do this in this church we right. no longer sing old hot hymns in this church mm -hmm. we know because people want to be a postmodern church right right but they don't understand that god is an ancient god is the same yesterday today and forever he Amen. doesn't change so we don't change our message because society changes or it fits in with what society demands. No, it is the church, is the beacon. It is the ambassador. It is the embassy. Every church is an embassy for the kingdom of heaven upon this earth. And we are on sovereign land. So if an embassy is on sovereign land, then we need to be dictated by the rules of God and by the rules of the word of God. We can't just change. And that's what we're seeing today. You know, we've got some crazy things, you know, just recently there were some witches in America that came out and said that they are Christian witches and they're having their first uh, Christian witches conference. Now that's just crazy. Mm -hmm. But the point is, how did that apathy allow that to come in? Where mm -hmm. is the outcry? Today we have got Christians that are being persecuted and dying all around the world. And where is the outcry about that? It is not even heard. It's not or even spoken heard. about, right? Yeah. So, so the agenda of the Antichrist that is at work, right? He's not fully revealed, but he's at work at present. The culture is being set. The, uh, you know, the stage is being set for him to take his place. That culture is anti-Christ everywhere we go. So we need God because we've tried to do it in our own flesh. We need God to come. 
We need him to come. Now, look at this. Joel 2.17 says, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep before the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and give not your inheritance to reproach, that the nation shall rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? And that is the truth today. The nations are oppressing churches to keep them silent. And those that are in those countries, you know, you may be persecuted, not necessarily by losing your life, but we are all persecuted as Christians. Each one of us are going through a different level of persecution. persecution but, right. but we ourselves must know that those things must come. But what did the disciples do? The disciples in Acts 4, when they were being persecuted, what did they do? They prayed, they worshiped. And God didn't say, okay, I'll remove you from here to remove the persecution. He gave them more boldness to go and declare the gospel. The key was to declare the gospel. It's, it, actually, it says in Acts 4, it, the first thing is to preach the gospel. We need the preaching of the gospel to come back because when, when the gospels preach, it actually comes against the principalities. It's the best force to come against it. prayer and preaching of the gospel because that's what happens. When the gospel is declared, we saw in Acts chapter 8, we saw that Philip, you know, when he went to minister to the people, even they had the false, you know, the false magician there, um, Simeon that was there, and he preached and all the people saw the signs and wonders. They saw what he was doing and they came to the Lord and they were baptized and they were coming to the Lord. We need the genuine real McCoy of preaching of the gospel, whether it is in America, whether it is in Mexico, whether it is in Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, whatever it is, we need those remnant people that God is speaking to, even as they're hearing this message, God is speaking to you. Don't wait for someone else to do it because that's the problem we have today. Oh, someone else will come and do it. We have so many preachers. No, no, no. God is calling you. God is speaking to you. It's time to arise and shine for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Yes, darkness has covered the earth. Darkness is even covering the people. But God is saying that he will rise above those who are willing to seek him in this hour. Thank you, Pastor Robert. Can you end in prayer specifically about that? And for us, for the nation, for the world to open our eyes and that it is time, it is time to preach the word of God, being bold and courageous and praying for a revival. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you as I humbly come before your throne room of grace. I enter with thanksgiving and praise. I come through the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray right now, Lord, as we repent on behalf of our mercy, we repent on behalf of any lukewarmness, any compromise that we may have done. Heavenly Father, stir up a fire within our heart. We may, Lord, see a repentance revival. We know we cannot have revival without genuine repentance. But Lord, I pray for a godly sorrow to come within the hearts of us as believers revival is for the church of jesus christ it starts with us before it starts in the world it starts with us on our knees crying out for mercy crying out for god's richness to come pour out your spirit upon all flesh oh lord i pray for god to arise in this hour lord i pray for those ministers of god call them to come and weep at the porch weep at the altar in this hour in the name of jesus god we thank you for what you're doing and what you're about to do in joel 1 13 it says gird yourselves and lament you priests wail you ministers of the altar come lie all night in sackcloth you ministers of of my god for the great offering and the drink offering is withheld from the house of your God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would come before you, prosper and in dire need of you to come and pour out your spirit upon the church in this hour. I pray for each person. I pray for those that are desiring more of you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You have just listened to Marina Maria, who is the host of Faith City Outreach and the founder of Global Gospel Worship Radio. 
Marina interviews local pastors and global leaders to share their testimonies and their ministries. If you're interested in being on Faith City Outreach, please contact Marina Maria at fcoprogram at gmail.com. This music is made as a courtesy from zapsplat.com. Marina wants to thank Four Winds Ministries for partnering with Faith City Outreach.